So as you should already know, enzymes are biological, biological catalysts and they work by lowering the activation energy for a reaction. So I'm going to go over with you now um, what I mean by activation energy. So as you can see from the beautiful sketch graph that I'm drawing, the energy of the products needs to be less than the energy of the substrates. Otherwise the reaction would not go ahead, but we say in chemistry would not be energetically viable. So as you can see, the energy level of the products here on the graph is below that of the substrates. And basically what happens is that in most chemical reactions, a little bit of energy is required to get that reaction going, almost like sort of trying to climb up a hill. And once you've got up that hill, then you can come down the other side. Now we call that amount of energy the activation energy. That's the energy required to get a chemical reaction going. And what enzymes do is that they lower the activation energy for a chemical reaction. So as you can see, less energy is needed to get that reaction going. And obviously this is a huge advantage in, in biological systems where typical temperatures are, are very low um, compared to what you would expect to see in, like, in industry, sort of obviously in the human body, 37 degrees centigrade, which is, is it really is relatively low. So we'll be moving on now to look at exactly how enzymes lower this activation energy and that will be with reference to their active site and how it can actually change shape ever so slightly once the substrate is bound and um, basically building upon the work that you did at GCSE with the lock and key theory actually it's a little bit more complex than that and we actually have a theory called the induced fit theory which I'll explain on the following slide. Okay so um, here we have um, the induced fit model Okay, and this is the model by which enzymes actually change shape ever so slightly when they bind onto the substrate. And this gives us sort of more snug fit and is basically the, re the reason how and why enzymes reduce activation energy. Okay, so from GCSE you would have talked about the lock and key theory of enzyme substrate complexes. It's very similar to that. As you can see over here on the left we have our enzyme. Um, with its active site and the substrate in green which you can see is, is, is basically what we call complementary complementary to the active site okay that's a, a word that you would expect to see um, you aren't using in an exam question answer okay when it once it binds to that active site you can see actually it's not a totally perfect fit and what we actually get is a very slight change in the shape of the active site okay so once we've got that enzyme substrate complex both the enzyme and the substrate actually but it's easy just to imagine the enzyme the active site ever so slightly changes and I suppose you could imagine that that sort of puts by actually squeezing the substrate you can imagine it puts pressure through the bonds of the substrate and actually makes them easier to break and that is one of the ways in which enzymes lower the activation energy. It makes the bonds easier to break. There are several ways in which enzymes actually do this. That's just one. So as we can see, once that's happened, the substrate, the, the, the chemical reaction has now happened, the substrate has been converted into products. They have a slightly different shape and again are now no longer complementary. Okay, so again, that word is a word that we need to be using in exam questions. We know when we're talking about substrates and active sites, we need to make reference to the word complementary. The products are a different shape. Okay, they're a different shape. And therefore, they no longer fit the active site. They are not complementary, and they're therefore free to move away from the enzyme. This, in essence, makes that enzyme reusable. Okay, so that is the induced fit model for enzyme substrate complexes. The lock and key version you were taught at GCSE, we actually obviously now know that it, it is a little bit more complex than that.
Okay, so we need to be able to explain the effect of temperature on enzyme action. So first of all, we'll be looking at as sort of that part before we get to the optimum where rate of reaction is increasing. In this area, we've got an increase in kinetic energy. So we're talking about the, you know, the enzyme itself and the substrates having more energy and therefore moving around a lot more. The more kinetic energy there is, the more collisions there are going to be between the enzyme and the, the substrate, more successful collisions. And that really is just GCSE chemistry. The more successful co collisions there are, the more successful enzyme-substrate complexes will be formed. And so therefore the rate will increase up to a point, which we call the optimum. And obviously following this, we, we know that our enzyme gets denatured. And I'll talk to you more about that on the following slide. So again, in terms of an exam question, the sorts of things that you'd be expected to comment on when you're writing a question about enzymes, you just need to make sure you've double-checked the question. Is it asking why rate is increasing? Does it ask about the whole thing? In which case you'll need to refer to my next slide, or is it just talking about the denaturing part? So just check the question. But if it is generally about why rate of reaction has gone up, you must make sure you refer to kinetic energy in your answer. The more kinetic energy there is, more collisions there are. Again, linking those collisions to collisions between the substrate and the enzyme and the formation of these complexes is a key part of this and clearly rounding that all up to reference to the rate of reaction increasing. When you're talking about, although I haven't mentioned it on here, when you're talking about anything to do with enzymes, you must always reference the active site. Okay, so I'm talking about enzyme substrate complexes it would be there that I'd be mentioning the successful collisions are actually between the substrate and the active site of that enzyme. Okay, so what actually happens when an enzyme denatures? First of all, the, the increased temperature gives such a large amount of kinetic energy that eventually the actual atoms themselves will start to pull apart, and that's going to obviously break the bonds that are holding those side chains together. Hydrogen bonds first of all, but eventually the disulfide bridges then will go as well. Of course, this is going to have a consequence, and that is going to be that it changes the shape of the active site. The substrate will no longer fit into it or is no longer complementary, and therefore you get fewer enzyme substrate complexes and the rate of reaction will decrease eventually will become zero of course this whole process is irreversible by breaking these bonds these h bonds and then the disulfide bridges that are holding the amino acids in the active site together in their specific shape by breaking those you're going to change the shape permanently if that shape is different the substrate will not be complementary, it will no longer fit in. Consequently, there will be fewer enzyme substrate complexes, the key things that we need to get this reaction going. And of course, therefore, the rate of reaction is going to go down eventually to zero, and that will be the end of that enzyme. The only way that we can do anything about that now is to physically make more enzyme. So in an exam question, if you're writing an answer about denaturing, obviously I've underlined here in black sort of the key the key terms that you would need to include. Obviously, we'd we'd need to talk about that increase in kinetic energy that I mentioned at the start, um, the H bonds, the disulfide bridges. You'd need to reference the active site changing shape. That is vital. As I said before in our previous slides, talking about this this idea of complementary fit. If you change the shape of the active site, it will not be complementary anymore. The consequence of that, fewer enzyme substrate complexes. Link that all to the decrease in reaction, rate of reaction. So these are the terms that we must make sure that we get into our answers and avoid us being a little bit too vague about generally what's going on, but be very specific about the biochemistry that is happening in the active site. So it's obviously also important to realise that enzymes have lots of different optimums. Biological enzymes have lots of different optimums. Um, obviously, the human body has um, an optimum temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. Um, but actually, probably most of those enzymes would work slightly above that. Um, and we've just evolved, really, to have just a few degrees below that, basically offsetting the uh, additional requirements for sort of the energy that would be required to, to be warm enough to get those reactions going yes, okay, that would make those reactions a little bit faster, but there is going to be a consequence, and obviously we'd have to um, 
basically get more, more fuel in to enable that to happen. So there are also, of course, those cases where you might get a fever, an infection, and your um, temperature is going to go sort of slightly above that 37. And again, you wouldn't want your enzymes to all be denaturing. Um, so actually, yeah, human sort of the human body, the enzymes there would have optimums actually around sort of 40. There are also, of course, lots of different um, types of organisms which have all different um, optimum temperatures. And actually, when you start looking at some of your extremophiles, your bacteria, you can get quite a big range of enzymes from sort of really low down at 10 degrees, potentially even lower than that, and um, right up to, to hot, the sort of ones you find in the hot springs, 80 plus, 80 degrees centigrade plus. So it's really important just to be aware of that. And also just to remember, we're, we're looking at enzymes here, but, but all proteins work on the principle that they have a special shape, as we've, we've previously learned. And therefore, it's not just about denaturing enzymes. If you change the shape of proteins, you affect their function. And if you heat them up beyond their optimum, you will change their shape and they will no longer work. And if you think about examples such as, as antibodies and antigens, um, hormones and receptors, all, all of the proteins will be affected in the same way. It's just that we're specifically focusing here on enzymes. So as previously discussed, pH is actually a measure of hydrogen ion concentration, so I'm now going to explain how a change in this can affect enzyme activity. The crude graph just showing two different types of enzyme you have heard of, pepsin, find which breaks down proteins in the stomach, and an enzyme called arginase, which as you can see has a much higher pH. Um, in both cases you can see they both have an optimum pH in which they work. I said pepsin, quite acidic, found in the stomach, probably pH 2 ish um, and either side of that they very quickly denature not like with temperature where it sort of increases up to the optimum and then decreases it, it's just denatured either side two ways in which it can cause problems for enzymes number one it can actually affect the charges in the actual amino acids found in the active site so if you remember um, side chains of amino acids can contain the groups um, carboxylic acid group and an amino group the acid group can lose hydrogen ions, the amino group can pick them up, and that means if you, you change the pH, you can affect the charges on those, and that means that they won't be able to bind necessarily bind the active site. The other more obvious way is that actually if the, if the change was large enough, it could actually denature the enzyme. It could actually cause the bonds within that hold the tertiary structure together. It could cause those ionic, actually it can also affect hydrogen bonds, but it's primarily or easier to think about the ionic bonds. Um, as I said, if the pH change is large enough, then you could actually start to really affect the tertiary structure of the enzyme, and actually that would, would change the shape of the active site. And again, the usual words then that we need to use in our exam questions are it's no longer complementary, the uh, substrate will no longer fit the active site, fewer enzyme substrate complexes, rate of reaction goes down. As you can see, this enzymes have a fairly tight pH in which they can work. And as I said, it is it's either side of that optimum where you will see them being denatured. It is really important to remember, however, that we, we don't tend to see big fluctuations in pH and sort of under normal circumstances in cells. Um, obviously, this the, of course, enzymes can be denatured by big changes in pH for the reasons explained. Um, and there are examples in the human body mainly surrounded um, around digestion. So clearly th there's an enzyme in the mouth called amylase that's got to pass through the stomach where the pH has gone massively acidic and clearly that's going to, de to denature that enzyme. It's a huge fluctuation in pH. And for that reason, the small intestine actually makes small amylase so that carbohydrate digestion can continue, starch into maltose in that case. Now, of course, lots of biochemical processes do um, generate hydrogen ions. I won't go into the details of that now, but we do get we do get small fluctuations in pH, and the body is very clever, and it has it has something called buffering system, which generally tends to mop up um, those excess hydrogen ions. Again, you'll learn a little bit more about that as we move through the course.